Hi, I'm Dick Miller. I teach in philosophy and direct the program in ethics and public life. Uh, in the series so far on deep issues of the 2012 elections, uh, there's been a lot of illuminating discussion of economic inequality, of electoral politics, and how they interact. Uh, for example, at the start of the series, Jacob Hacker and Larry Bartels talked about the role of economic inequality in determining who gets elected and shaping legislation and the role of the legislation that results in shaping, in fact, in making much steeper economic inequality over the last several decades. That's been enormously enriching, but two things have been left out. Social movements have been left out. And so has something that I'll have to introduce with a name standing for a horribly unscientific, terribly abused concept, race. Horrible and unscientific as the concept is, it stands for a reality that has to be discussed. Attitudes towards races as they're seen, towards ethnic groups and their impact on people's lives. Another powerful source in the history of the United States of gross inequality. Uh, it's time that we fill that gap. The differences between votes for President Obama and Governor Romney in the last election between whites, African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans have become a central topic of discussion of American electoral politics. And so as a question about social movements, what is the Tea Party going to do? So we have a real need to have someone come to us and talk about the interaction between the institutional and the non-institutional, between on the one hand, elections and legislation, on the other hand, social movements and that broad and terrible category of attitudes that come under the label race. I can think of no one better to fill this gap than today's speaker, Doug McAdam. Kendra Bishop from the sociology department will introduce him and no doubt you will then understand why, and then he'll give his talk on how we got into this mess. Kendra? Um, so I've been asked to say a few words today, primarily because Doug was my graduate school advisor, so I feel very lucky for that and very excited to have him here today at Cornell. Um, Doug is really the preeminent scholar in social movements as well as political sociology. Um, he is an a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as a recipient of countless academic fellowships and awards. He has published numerous books, including Political Process and the Development of Black Insurgency, 1930 to 1970, Freedom Summer, which won the C. Wright Mills Award, The Dynamics of Contention with Sid Tarot and Charles Tilley, and most recently, A Theory of Fields with Neil Flickstein, which has already garnered much attention as a seminal book in political and organizational sociology. In addition, he has published over 50 articles in academic journals. He is currently working on a book entitled Democracy Imperiled, Race, Class, and the Emerging Politics of Inequality, 1960 to 2012. Doug has been enviably, enviably productive throughout his career and continues to be prolific year after year. Although one could produce a fairly long introduction for Doug uh, that consists entirely of scholarly accomplishments, I want to say a few words now about Doug's accomplishments in another aspect of a professor's job, teaching. As one of Doug's former students, um, I am in a position to praise Doug for some things that you won't find on his CV. My first teaching experience in graduate school was as a teaching assistant for Doug's Intro to Sociology course. Uh, so I was on the, I'm on the front lines here teach, uh, speaking about his teaching. Uh, this was fortunate for me because I was eager to get to know him as a scholar, um, though I had, didn't really have any expectations regarding the quality of his teaching at this time. 
I didn't know much about him, but I figured he probably didn't have too much time for teaching, given his busy schedule, um, and this being a fairly large introductory course, uh, primarily catering to freshmen and sophomores, I thought, you know, it would be pretty routine. Uh, but it wasn't. I watched as Doug brought sociology to life through the close reading of original texts, not just telling students, but showing them what is distinctive about the sociological perspective, uh, to think of oneself not only as a social actor, but as a social product. I watched students change the way they thought in a matter of just 10 weeks. The last day of that class, I sat in awe, really, as students literally lined up to thank Doug and to tell him that it was the best course they had ever taken. But Doug is a master teacher, and he's very funny, which doesn't hurt, uh, and a, really a model for how to balance the demands of scholarship and teaching. So Doug embodies the rare combination of highly influential scholar, inspirational and effective teacher, and a really down-to-earth individual. Today's lecture is entitled, How Do We Get Into This Mess? <coughs> Parties, Movements, and Their Transformation of American Politics, 1960 to 2012. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Doug Nagata. Thank you very much, Dick, first of all, for your wonderful remarks. And Kendra, that was very special, actually, to have you introduce me. We miss Kendra at Stanford. Uh, but Kendra and I and one other graduate, graduate, current graduate student are going to be starting work on a book fairly soon. So that makes me feel very happy to have the prospect of working with Kendra again. Uh, spectacular student. Um, this is uh, a real privilege for me to um, be a part of such um, an extraordinary and timely series. And I commend Dick and uh, the organizing committee um, for putting this kind of a series together kind of in the run-up to the election and in, in, the, in the aftermath of the election. Um, and I, again, I feel very honored to, uh, to, to be invited to participate. The other speakers in the series are just extraordinary. I wish I could have been here to, to hear their remarks as well, but I feel very, again, honored uh, to be here to take part in the series. And I want to thank all of you guys for taking time out of busy schedules and lives to come to the talk. Um, the title, as Kendra said, is How Did We Get Into This Mess? Um, what, what mess are, am I referring to exactly? Uh, there are lots of features of contemporary American life that could be described as messy. Um, I, I'm going to refer to two principal features that are absolutely central to the focus of the series. And then one other, um, one other aspect as well, although I won't devote as much attention to it in the talk. Um, extreme inequality, these deep partisan divisions that characterize the contemporary United States, and what I would characterize as a certain kind of legitimacy crisis, that is, very high levels of felt distrust and lack of confidence in public officials, in governmental institutions, et cetera. Um, you guys have probably seen time series figures kind of like this one. They might have been featured in some of the earlier presentations. But let me just highlight these three features of contemporary American life and politics. Um, this, again, is a time series figure of what's called the Gini Index. This is a very well-established measure of income inequality. Uh, it's used cross-nationally, but this refers to income inequality in the United States. And the time series really runs from 1913 to 2009. But I'm trying to highlight here the real stark difference between the post-war period and roughly the mid-70s to the present. Post-war period, remarkably low levels of economic income inequality, at least in the US context. And then around the mid-1970s, the, the figure turns upwards and, as, and ascends pretty dramatically, pretty quickly, um, to the, the very high levels that we are at at present. So we went from really comparatively equal income inequality, relatively low levels of income inequality, to very extreme levels of income inequality at present. And this trend data 
it, can, it could be mirrored in other institutional arenas as well, health outcomes, educational outcomes, etc. So that's one feature of American society um, we want to, I want to talk about a little bit today. Second is the deep political divisions in the country. This is another time series figure, um, courtesy of two exceptional political scientists, Poole and Rosenthal, who since uh, at least 1980 have made something of an art form out of measuring the closeness the I of the ideological positions of any two members of Congress, any two members of the House or Senate. So with their technique, they can tell you how, far, how close or far apart any two senators are in their ideological positions on a standard left-right political continuum. And again, I want to call your attention to this extraordinary contrast between the post-war period, it's actually really late 30s to the mid-60s, where in both the House and Senate, the two parties are very close together ideologically. There's a lot of partisan overlap. There's a lot of ideological overlap between the two parties in both the House and Senate. Um, but again, beginning late 60s, early 70s, the, the trend line turns up and really accelerates sharply especially in the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives at present is more divided than at any time since the run-up to the Civil War. That's how divided the House is. The Senate, not quite so much, but still very high levels of partisan polarization in the Senate as well as the House. So that's a second feature. And the third feature that I, again, won't spend as much time talking about is uh, the confidence or trust in government, in governmental institutions, in the parties, in Congress, et cetera. Uh, this question that uh, the time series reflects was first asked in 1958 on the National Election Study, and it's been asked periodically ever since. So our first measure here is 1958. But again, in the end of this post-war period, late 50s into the mid-60s, you have very high levels of expressed trust or confidence in government. It turns down with the war, the, the war in Vietnam, Watergate, et cetera, settles into a relatively low trough, but we're at the lowest level presently in this entire time series, a 50-plus year time series. So the question that kind of animates this talk uh, is really how did we go from the relative equality, uh, uh, partisan consensus, bipartisan consensus, strong bipartisan consensus, and high levels of trust and confidence in government that characterized roughly the 25 years after World War II to a very unequal, deeply divided country we, we see today. Um, Again, this is that stark contrast I've tried to highlight, 45 to 70, relative economic equality, strong bipartisan consensus, widespread trust and confidence in government. Uh, and how did we get from there to here? That's the question kind of before us for the talk. It's also the central question that's animating this book project um, that Kendra mentioned. The, the whole book is really going to be focused on answering that question. How did we go from that period, the 20, 25 years after World War II, with all I, what I would say are very positive features of American politics and society more generally, to the deep division, sharp inequality we see today? The argument and the empirical kind of documentation to bolster the argument is very complicated in the book. Obviously, I can't possibly try to um, kind of uh, lay all that out in a 40, 45 minute talk. Instead, what I'm going to do is simply communicate the central argument I'm trying to make in the book, and then talk about two specific historic moments, actually two episodes in the early to mid 1960s that I think both illustrate the central argument I'm trying to make, theoretical argument I'm trying to make, but, that will, but these two episodes, these two moments, will also, I think, help us understand where the pivot point came 
in this transformation I'm talking about, where we began to edge away from uh, the, par the post-war period and into the more deeply divided, more unequal society that we, we see before us today. So that's, that's really my goals here. Um, again, I want to underscore a central difference between the post-war period and now, post-war in, in, in particular the, the deep partisan divisions. Um, you know, today what we lament all the time is how deeply divided the country is, how deeply divided and distrustful political elites are in the two parties, etc. To the extent that there was a complaint about the post-war period, it was that the two parties were too similar. They didn't present voters with a real alternative. This was seriously voiced as a criticism at the time. Former Alabama Governor George Wallace, who ran as a third party candidate, is going to figure in our story pretty prominently, ran as a third party candidate in 1968. And when he was pressed about why he wanted to run in the election, he said, because there's not a damn bit of difference between these two jokers. That was his quote. The two jokers were Hubert Humphrey, who was the Democratic nominee for president, and Richard Nixon on the Republican side. Um, but this kind of moderate centrist position, this pragmatic kind of centrist position that both parties occupied in the post-war period, was key to the, to the high levels of bipartisan consensus that developed in those years, and that was key to lots of key, uh, major pieces of legislation including the major civil rights uh, acts of the 1960s. So there were lots of positive features of this kind of centrist connection between the two parties in this period. We were also told at the time, that is during the post-war period, that this kind of the centrist orientation of the two major parties was almost kind of a natural law um, given our, our natural law of politics given our winner-take-all uh, system, especially presidential elections. Um, Anthony Downs uh, wrote in 1957 a book called the, uh, or a book was published called The Economic Theory of Democracy. Very, very influential. Downs' argument is very complicated and very sophisticated, but I'm going to oversimplify a bit. Basically, Downs said, hey, look, in a winner-take-all a two-party system, it's rational for the two parties to hew very close to the center. They want to pull together uh, as broad an electoral coalition as they can. And the best place along the ideological continuum for them to do that is in the center. And he said that if either party is perceived as moving too far off center, the median voter, the imagined median voter, will rise up and vote that party out of office. So they would be punished for straying too far from the center. And that was the standard argument. And indeed, in this period, the post-war period, the real world data really seemed to fit Downs' argument very, very well. When his book was published, the quintessential moderate uh, centrist Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, was in the White House. Three years later, uh, Kennedy and Nixon were the choices of their respective parties, and these were quintessential kind of pragmatic, centrist politicians. Kennedy for the Democrats, Nixon for the Republicans. In 1968, as Wallace said, Nixon and Humphrey, the choice of the two parties, also he felt were too close together ideologically. They occupied the center of the ideological distribution, and he represented the true, a true alternative to those two. Um, and maybe, maybe most um, importantly, in both 1964 and 1972, two candidates seen as extreme, extreme, uh, very extreme at the time, were beaten handily in their elections uh, by moderate centrist candidates. In 1964, Barry Goldwater was the Republican nominee, quite surprisingly to many. He was viewed at the time as rabidly conservative, as an extreme conservative. I think he'd actually be somewhat centrist today in the Republican Party. 
Um, but he was beaten very, very soundly in 1964 by Lyndon Johnson. In 72, McGovern, probably the most left of center Democratic candidate in history, was beaten even more convincingly by Nixon in Nixon's second race for the White, third race for the White House. Um, but after, but, but events of late, events since then, and especially from 1980 onward, are much, much harder to square with Down's theory and with this notion of the median voter. Uh, we have moved very far off center, uh, especially on, today on the Republican side, but uh, also on the, on the Democratic side earlier in this period. So the theory starts to lose uh, a lot of in, uh, empirical traction, I would say, late 70s and certainly after 1980. So again, how did this happen? How have the parties, if in fact we were told that parties were necessarily going to hew to the center politically, how is it that they both at different times have moved dramatically off center uh, since 1960, 70? And that's what I want to talk about. Um, the key, and this is the central argument I'm trying to make tonight, Social movements um, are really the key to understanding the dramatic change in politics from the post-war period to the, to the present. Um, one of the other features of the post-war United States, from roughly 1940 to 1960, was the almost total absence of significant social movement activity. It's probably the longest period uh, in American history where we have virtually no significant social movement activity. And I think that's, that's in fact why Downs' argument held so well during those years. There were no, it is very easy for parties to hew to the political center when there are no mobilized movement wings pushing them off center. On the Republican side, very right-wing movements. On the, on the Democratic side, left-wing movements pushing those parties off-center. But starting literally in the year 1960, movements were reintroduced as a major force in American political and social life. And uh, over time, in different ways, pushed the parties, I would argue, off-center politically and help us understand how we moved from this kind of bipartisan consensus of the post-war period to a, to, to a situation we have today where we have deep divisions between the two parties, and neither party really occupies uh, the moderate center of the political distribution. Democrats perhaps more than Republicans, but neither are positioned really at the center of the ideological distribution. Um, I, uh, the, the slide says I'm going to talk about three moments. Uh, these three moments are episodes that I mentioned earlier that essentially reintroduce movements into American politics. I'm not going to talk about the third uh, moment. I'm only going to confine myself to the first two. Um, uh, I practiced this this morning, and it was way too long if I included the third moment. So I'm only going to talk about the first two. But in the Q&A, if somebody wants to ask me about the third moment, I'd be very happy to answer. All right, so I'm going to talk about these first two. Um, and where am I? So the, the first moment, or first episode, that really powerfully reintroduces movements into American politics. It's the civil rights movement. And there's two myths, there's lots of myths about the civil rights movement, but there's two in particular that I want to talk about here because they're important to the, the, the story I want to tell. Uh, the first myth is that the movement developed, emerged in Montgomery in 1955-56, the Montgomery bus boycott, and from that point forward, represented a constant force for social change until at least the late 1960s, 19, early 1970s. Um, that is not correct. Um, there's, two, there's two problems with that kind of account, temporal account of the civil rights movement. Uh, 
For one thing, as a lot of civil rights scholars have written in the last, say, 15 years, this is too narrow a temporal definition of the civil rights movement. Uh, scholars are now talking and offering lots of powerful evidence for what they call the long civil rights movement that begins well before 1955-56 and indeed extends well afterwards. So that's one issue, but that's not the one I want to talk about here. Even if you buy the narrower, shorter version of the civil rights movement as something that runs from 1955 to 1970, it is not a consistent force for social change between 55 and 70 at all. Uh, and I apologize for this. This is hopelessly light. Um, and I, there, I know there's no way you can read these axes, but let me read them for you. This is actually a figure I drew by hand as a graduate student in 1975. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, on the bottom is time, 1948 to 1976. On the left-hand axis are number of civil rights movement initiated events. 1948 to 1976, okay? And it, it runs from zero to 660. The peak, peak, peak is exactly 660 events. That's in 1965. That's a lot of events. These are coded out of the New York Times, reading every page of the New York Times and coding these things. 660 discrete movement initiated events. That's an enormous number. Um, this peak here is 1960, when the sit-ins revived what, what was a, more, a moribund movement. Okay? This little teeny peak is Montgomery, the Montgomery bus boycott. There's about 110, 115 events. Okay? Not trivial but nowhere near is the magnitude of what the movement's going to become in the early, 19, early to mid-1960s. And notice, there's almost nothing before Montgomery, and the movement drops off dramatically after Montgomery. That's largely because the South mounted a massive resistance campaign to the twin threats of Montgomery, and Brown v. Board of Education, that is the desegregation, the push for desegregation in southern schools. And there was an absolute flood of legislation coming out of southern legislative bodies, especially in the Deep South, that made it virtually impossible for the movement to operate. So that's my point. There was really no continuous movement from Montgomery. The movement was effectively dead in the water as the 60s dawned, what revitalized the civil rights struggle were the sit-ins in the spring of 1960. So that reinforces my point. The only significant movement activity in the 40s or 50s, I would argue, was this upsurge in 55. Otherwise, there's nothing much going on. So the parties are really spared the, the centrifugal pressures of significant social movement activity on either the right or left in the 40s and 50s. Okay, so that's one myth I wanted to talk about. The second myth is that um, the great kind of institutional ally of the civil rights struggle was the Democratic Party. What is true is by the time we get to the mid-60s, the great legislative achievements of the civil rights movement are, are definitely require strong sponsorship by the Johnson administration. There's absolutely no question about that. So the great legislative victories, Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, could not have come about absent significant democratic, democratic sponsorship of those bills. That's true. That's a, just about as much of what is true about that second myth. And I want to talk about in some detail the, the evolution in the relationship between the Democratic Party and the civil rights movement or civil rights forces 
And I'm going to do it through a series of electoral maps. Because it's important, again, to set the context for the story I want to tell about how dramatically the relationship between the Democratic Party and the movement changed with the upsurge in movement activity in the spring of 1960. Uh, there are really four periods. You can distinguish between four distinct periods in the relationship between the Democratic Party and the civil rights movement. The first period is 1877 to 1928. That's more than 50 years. 1877, 1877 marks the end of Reconstruction. And this period, again, extends till 1932 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected president. During this period, the electoral foundation of the Democratic Party is the White South, the Dixiecrat wing of the party. Um, on matters of race, at, uh, the agenda is set by the segregationist wing of the Democratic Party. It is the so-called Solid South. It is a one-party racial autocracy. There's no two-party system in the southern United States. No one would possibly try to be a Republican in the South. African Americans don't vote, almost, with, with a few exceptions. And nobody would be, be a Republican in that environment. Why? Because it was the party of Lincoln, you know, which brought the war of Northern aggression on the South. So the Democratic Party is centrally the party of the segregationist South. And I'll tell the story just with one electoral map. I'm not going to go all the way back to 1880 or something. This is Herbert Hoover's decisive win in the election of 1928. He's the Republican candidate. Uh, the Democrats carry Massachusetts and Rhode Island, but they can always count on the solid South. Solid South is not going to vote. There will be no Republican votes uh, in the South, the Deep South in any case. Second period in the evolving relationship between the Democratic Party and the Civil Rights Movement, 1932 to 1945, which conveniently demarcate the 13 years that Franklin Delano Roosevelt is President of the United States. Um, Roosevelt's election in 1932 is, of course, driven entirely by the Depression. Republicans were dominant all through the 20s. In fact, they were dominant from 1900 to 1928. Hoover, however, was blamed. The Republicans and Hoover in particular were blamed for the Depression. And here's the result. Oops. There's the result. Big blue map with, again, obviously solid Democratic support in the southern United States. Um, this election, essentially, with this election, we, have, we, we really are talking about the birth of the modern, northern, liberal, labor, Democratic Party. It didn't exist prior to that. This election marks the ascendance of that liberal, northern, labor wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, but, and it also marks the beginning of what is referred to as the New Deal Coalition, the ultimate strange bedfellows, liberal northern labor Democrats and southern segregationists. A very strange political coalition driven again by history. The South is going to remain solidly Democratic because of its hatred of the Republican Party even though it is now paired with the liberal progressive northern Liber, uh, labor wing of the party. Uh, here's, oh, God, go forward. There is 1936. Roosevelt wins again uh, with an equally huge margin. His margin is a little bit less in 1940. He's running for the third time. Still wins convincingly, and the South remains reliably blue, as is true in 1944 as well, the last time he's elected. The important point I want to make here is, yes, this is now increasingly the modern, liberal, labor, uh, democratic party. I want to add something else. African-American voters, northern African-American uh, voters, 
uh, who were reliably Republican switch party allegiance and align with the Democrats in 1936 because of Roosevelt's New Deal policies. So you now have African Americans as a fairly reliable part of the Democratic coalition along with Southern segregationists. Okay? Um, so what's the party's view on race? Gee, with all these liberal Northern labor Democrats, surely they're embracing civil rights reform. Absolutely not. Roosevelt says nothing about civil rights reform in his 13 years in office, even though he's pressured to do so on a consistent basis. He won't have any of it. He totally defers to the southern wing of his party. He wants to hold on to the white south, and he's not going to mess with custom. So the Democrats, even though the party now looks different, on matters of race, the South still sets the agenda. Third stage of this relationship, 1945 to 1960, the Cold War reintroduces, renationalizes the issue of race in the United States. This is not the scales falling from our eyes. This is not a moral awakening in the United States. Race had been organized out of federal policy making at the end of Reconstruction. It only comes back on the table in 1945 because of the Cold War. What does the Cold War have to do with race? Simple. Here we are locked in the post-war period in this intense struggle with the Soviet Union for influence around the globe. We are professing the superiority of democratic ideals and getting hammered around the world for the clear contradiction between our democratic ideals and racist practices at home. The Cold War effectively forces all Cold War presidents to at least embrace the notion of civil rights reform, limited civil rights reform. Truman, who takes over from Roosevelt when Roosevelt dies in office in 1945, is the first post, uh, Cold War president. And he does indeed embrace the need for limited civil rights reform. He issues several executive orders that are the first real uh, pro-civil rights executive order since Reconstruction. He makes civil rights reform an important part of the party's platform in 1948. And he does so even though he knows he's risking the wrath of the southern wing of his party. And the wrath comes. The, the South, uh, a coalition of southern actors, create a third party called the States Rights Party. They run a presidential candidate named Strom Thurmond. The name will be familiar to some of you because Strom Thurmond, he was the most loyal of Dixiecrats in 1948. He died in office at 102, what, six, seven years ago, as the most loyal Republican, which is where we're going in this story. In any case, in 48, the Deep South, they won't have anything to do with voting Republican, mind you. But they run a third party candidate on the state's rights party platform because they're angry at the Democrats and for Truman for embracing, even in a, in a limited way, the need for civil rights reform. So there's tensions inside the Democratic coalition now because of this embrace of civil rights. You, many of you have seen that iconic picture of Truman holding, everybody assumed Truman would lose. And there's this iconic picture of Truman holding up this newspaper headline that says, Dewey wins! Of course, Truman won by a narrow, narrow margin, but he still won. So the, ultimately, the Democrats stayed in power. In 52, Eisenhower is elected Republican president. He behaves with respect to civil rights the same way Truman did. That is, he too understands the need to embrace civil rights reform. He also issues pro-civil rights, uh, pro rights executive orders. He sends troops to Little Rock to enforce uh, court-ordered desegregation of Little Rock High School. 
And now the anger of the white South can be redirected to the Republican Party so everything is back to normal, right? Eisenhower wins you know, a, a pretty, pretty decisive victory, but look where the support for the Democrats comes. The solid South is solid again. There's 1956, Eisenhower's win. Again, the only opposition to Eisenhower in the country is the solid Democratic South. Um, my main point here is we, we continue to think of the Democrats as more broadly liberal on civil rights and Republicans as conservative. Look at the um, distribution of civil rights voting records in the Senate uh, in, the, in the 85th Congress, which spans 1957 to 1959. This comes from Carmines and Stimson, two political scientists who coded the voting records of, again, House and Senate members in various years. This is, again, 1957, 58, 59. There are 46 Republican senators. 42 have liberal civil rights voting records. Four conservatives. Look at the Democrats. 21 liberals. 27 conservatives mirroring this split between the North and the South. The Democrats are still absolutely committed to uh, supporting the Southern position on civil rights issues all through the late 50s. This holds in 1960. This is Kennedy's election. Kennedy wins by a narrow margin over Nixon. And again, he depends heavily on support in the Deep South. Then, all hell breaks loose. I showed you the time series data on the civil rights movement. In the spring of 1960s, the sit-in movement in the South re reinvigorates, reunites the civil rights movement and ushers in 10 extraordinary years of unrelenting political pressure uh, by the civil rights movement and, and the movement's allies. Kennedy really works hard to try to balance uh, the interests of the southern wing of his party and this increasingly active civil rights movement. But in the end, there's just no way to do that. There's no way ultimately to balance those interests. The movement pressure is unrelenting. And the international criticism, again, for repression against civil rights forces is at a very high level as well. Kennedy moves slightly left. Johnson, when he takes over for Kennedy after Kennedy is assassinated, Johnson moves the party very decisively left, not just on civil rights, but on a whole manner of social programs. And the long-threatened Southern revolt becomes real. The Deep South goes for Goldwater. Goldwater is seen as extreme conservative but he opposes the, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The white South, the deep South, aligns with the, Repu the hated Republican Party for the first time. And even though Johnson wins in a landslide, this sends shock waves through the kind of political establishment in the United States. Um, where do I want to go? Yes, OK. So, that brings us to the close of the first story about how the civ a revitalized civil rights movement puts incredible pressure on American society generally, but on the Democratic Party, which is in, controls the White House in the early 60s. And the Democrats, you saw where the Democrats were in 1958, considerably to the right of the Republicans on civil rights issues. By the time Johnson takes office and moves the party, the Democrats are much more left of center on civil rights matters and lots of other issues than the Republicans. Okay? So that's the centrifugal force of the civil rights movement pushing the Democrats off center politically to a much more left position that's unacceptable to the white South. Second story, second and final story. The 1960 marked not, the, the, not just the introduction of the civil rights movement into American society, but the white 
segregationist counter movement. We always forget there's a second movement that becomes very, very active to counter the civil rights movement. Initially, that movement is in fact confined almost entirely to the southern United States. These are the canonical images we all still retain in our heads. Uh, you know, fire hoses and police dogs in Birmingham, beatings in Selma, Alabama, the burning of black churches that were used, being used as, as kind of organizing centers of the civil rights movement, the disappearance of civil rights workers. Our images are southern images. But that movement spreads northward starting in 1964. So I refer to it much as a white resistance movement that characterizes the United States increasingly as the 60s unfold. And a key figure in the movement, the spread of the white resistance movement from the south to the north is indeed George Wallace. I mentioned him earlier. He's a key figure here. Wallace, in 1964, remember he's a Democrat, he says he's going to challenge Lyndon Johnson, the popular sitting, uh, sitting president from his own party, for the Democratic nomination for president. Wallace is only one year removed from something that's known as standing in the schoolhouse door. In 1963, George Wallace fulfilled a campaign promise to the white voters of Alabama by standing in the doorway of the University of Alabama and blocking the admission of the first black students admitted. He's a hero in the South, the white South. He's reviled by the mainstream press and established party leaders in the North, Republicans and Democrats alike. He's viewed as something of a joke. So less than a year later, he says, I'm going to challenge Johnson for the, the nomination the Democratic nomination for president. What a joke. Not a joke. They don't laugh very long. He enters only three primaries. There are only 11 primaries that year. He enters three of them. First one in Michigan, he takes 38% of the vote. You know, the heart of the liberal northern labor Democratic regime, he takes 38% of the vote. The, lib the Democratic establishment nationally is alarmed by this, and they commit everything to stopping Wallace in Indiana, and he takes almost a third of the vote. And then he narrowly loses in Maryland. That demonstration of white resistance outside of the South, coupled with the loss of the Deep South in the general election in 64, shifts gets the Republicans to start shifting very sharply to the right to court the votes of the white South. And again, lots of people talk about this happening in 1968, and we'll get there because 68 is indeed a breakthrough election, but look what's happening before then. You'll remember I showed you the civil rights voting records of the Republican and Democratic senators in the 85th Congress. That was 58, or 57, 58, 59. Eight years later, the 89th Senate, look at the distribution, and it reflects the movement off center by both parties. So look at the Democrats. In the 85th Congress, again, 21 liberal voting, or civil rights voting records among the Democratic uh, senators, 27 conservatives, racial conservatives. In the 89th, they have 66 senators, two-thirds, more than two-thirds, 70% uh, or so are racial liberals. So in eight years, the Democrats have moved dramatically left on civil rights and other issues as well. Look where the Republicans are going in the opposite direction. In, in the 85th Congress, 42 of 46 Republican senators are racial liberals. Eight years later, only 10 of 32. It's the pressure of these movements interacting with the parties that start moving them off center. And they've been moving away from each other ever since. Um, but let's keep going with the story. Here's 1968. 
three-way race, Humphrey, Nixon, and George Wallace, who enters not, he enters as a third-party candidate. The entire South uh, abandons the Democratic Party with the exception of Texas, which is not exactly Southern culturally. The East Texas is certainly culturally a part of the South, but the rest of Texas is not. But never mind that. But the Democrats lose the entire South with the exception of Texas. Um, Wallace takes the five deep South states and the electoral votes that go with them. Nixon wins in a squeaker. Essentially, Nixon and Humphrey split 86% of the popular vote. Wallace captures the remaining 14% and the electoral votes of the five deep south states. As the GOP looks forward to 72, it is very clear, and Nixon has said this, I mean, said this in print in his own biography, his chief strategist, Kenneth Phillips, said it in 1969 in print, in looking ahead, they weren't interested in trying to capture more of the liberal voters from the Democrats. They were absolutely intent on stealing or courting Wallace's voters. The future of the party lay with the 14% that Wallace got in 68. Nixon, and again, this is, uh, he has acknowledged this, one of his central priorities in his first ter term in office was signaling to the White South that the Republicans were their home, were going to be sympathetic to their views on racial matters. He picked three specific policy issues to send that signal, and I, I'll devote a little bit of time to only the last of these. The first one is he orders his Departments of Justice and HEW, Health, Education, and Welfare, to announce that schools will no longer be held to strict timetables for court-ordered desegregation. That's challenged in court, and very quickly he's rebuffed and he loses. I think he knew he was going to lose, but this is sending a powerful signal to the, to the white resistance movement, just, not just in the South, but nationwide. Secondly, he seeks to eliminate the pre-clearance provision of the Voting Rights Act. This is really relevant to today, and I'll say why in a minute. What's the pre-clearance provision? In the Voting Rights Act, there was a provision that said any uh, southern jurisdiction that has shown in the past a history of discriminatory voting practices will need to get clearance, pre-clearance, from the Justice Department if it wants to change any of its electoral procedures. That's the pre-clearance provision. Nixon wanted to eliminate it. Challenged, or it had to go before Congress. Congress, which was dom dominated up by Democrats, overturned it. I think Nixon knew it wouldn't win, but he also knew it would send a powerful signal. The reason I mention it's relevant, the Supreme Court this term will act on a case that, that is asking for them to throw out the pre-clearance, which is held to, to this day, throw out the pre-clearance provision of the Voting Rights Act on the grounds that racial discrimination in voting is a thing of the past, not given what went on in this election. There were lots of very transparent attempts to restrict the franchise on racial grounds. So, but I, I'm betting the Supreme Court will, in fact, um, overturn the preclearance provision, but we'll see. Finally, Nixon nominates two very, very racially conservative jurists for appointment to the Supreme Court. Again, I, I actually think he knew they couldn't get through a Democratic uh, Congress, and they don't. When they, when they don't get through, he holds a very, very, uh, 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 primetime news conference and, 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 with, and opens with this statement. I have reluctantly concluded with the Senate presently constituted, I cannot nominate to the Supreme Court any federal appellate judge from the South who believes as I do in the strict construction of the U.S. Constitution. I understand the bitter feelings of millions of Americans who live in the South about the act of regional discrimination that took place yesterday. 
They have my assurances that the day will come when men like Judges Carswell and Hainsworth can and will sit on the high court. This is a powerful set of messages that really solidifies Southern white support and conservative support for the Republican Party, which is really tacking to the right. This is the result in 1972. Now, there was help here. I, mean, I want to say this is entirely Nixon's doing. The, uh, the Democratic Party was racing to the left at this point. It had been thoroughly pushed to the left, not just by the Civil Rights Movement, but then later by the anti-war movement and the forces of the new left generally. The Democratic Party in 1972 kind of looks like today's Tea Party influenced Republican Party. The Democratic Party in 72 was about as far left as the party's ever been. And Wallace, who was running again, had been shot in an assassination attempt and was paralyzed. So his candidacy was, let's say, compromised. But a lot of this is Nixon's doing as the Republican Party positions itself as the increasingly a party of racial reaction. Um, and here was the invisible, the third one, but I'm not going to get to that. Um, or that. So, in conclusion, let me simply again, the argument is that the reason the two parties were so broadly centrist in the post-war period, at least one of the reasons, is that there were no mobilized movement wings pushing them to the margins. So they could position themselves at the center, very close to one another. The 60s reintroduced movements as a major force in American life and politics. Uh, and again, two movements in particular, the civil rights movement pushing the Democrats increasingly left, and the white resistance movement, first, first uh, uh, regionally in the South, but in, later nationally, pushing the Republicans ever further to the right, and we've more or less been on that course ever since. Finally, let me just m revisit these two features of contemporary American life and politics that I started with and tie them back to the argument I've made. Partisan polarization, largely a product of the centrifugal movement pressures that I've just talked about. That's why, that's why you see the two parties starting to move apart in the mid to late 60s. And it's movement pressures that keep pushing them on those two trajectories. I think that's largely why we are as divided as we are now. I think the same dynamic, again, was reflected, is reflected in the contemporary Republican Party, which is really trying to figure out how to accommodate a very strong mobilized movement on its ideological flank. That's the Tea Party. All right, and the, and the um, extreme inequality, two things, I think, help us understand how we move from the relative equality of the post-war period to the extreme inequality of today. First, the collapse of the New Deal coalition, and with it, 36 years of democratic dominance in economic policymaking. Democrats, more or less, were in control of economic policy making from 1932 to 1968. Tax policies under the Democrats were very, very different than, the, than they had been under the Republicans. And there were lots of investment in various social programs by the Democrats where the goal was really to, uh, to minimize the impact of disadvantage, various forms of disadvantage in American life. So the democratic poli economic policies were geared to try to create more economic equality, more generalized equality in the country. From 1968 to the present, Republicans have been increasingly dominant in economic policy making, and they've embraced different tax policies and different social policies that have promoted inequality. I'm not saying that's their intent, but that has been the cumulative effect of 40 plus years of economic do uh, uh, dominance and economic policy making by the GOP. And then one other factor, political polarization has itself been an important force promoting inequality. I showed you this figure earlier. This is again the Poole and Rosenthal time series on political polarization or party polarization. <clears throat> 
but overlaid on it is the blue, the blue is the Gini index. Again, the measure of economic inequality. They track very, very closely. They're related at the level of 0.95. And an extraordinary book by McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal that came out in 2007, they spend a lot of time explaining how it is that polarization itself has contributed to inequality. It's a very complicated and powerful argument. I won't try to go into it. But so polarization itself, the deep partisan divisions, have also had an effect, a measurable effect, on increasing inequality. Final thoughts. The normative implications of the brave new world of movement-inflected politics that has emerged over the past 50 years are very complicated. I'm not for a second saying, oh, we should get rid of social movements. That's the problem. That's certainly not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying we really do, we're now living in a very different political environment, political world in the United States than we were in in the post-war uh, post period. And it, there's all sorts of tricky normative issues that one could debate about this brave new world. What's clear is that the major trends most of us lament, polarization, inequality, distrust of government, owe in part to this brave new world of movement inflected politics. And the results of last Tuesday's election does nothing to change that. We are fundamentally still in that world. We're still deeply divided. Inequality is still all around us in various aspects of American life. So regardless of how one comes down on the results of last Tuesday's election, the sheer fact of that election doesn't change the nature of the political world we're living in. Thank you. <laughs> I got to run. You've been great. Thanks. Um, again, if, if, you, you know, if we had been sitting here in 1960 and someone said, God, the parties are so alike. Can't we get a little more diversity? Uh, you know, and people would have gone, nah, I don't think so. Yeah, clearly things will change. Uh, how and why they will change and when, I'm not quite sure. I mean, one line of speculation right now is that Given the results of last Tuesday's election, the Republican Party will have to wind, find a way to tack back a little bit to the center. And in particular on issues like immigration, we'll have to adopt a more centrist, moderate position if they want to continue to compete given the changing demographics of American society. Um, I, I would like to, I would really like to imagine that's possible. Um, uh, you can make the, the opposite argument that you've heard some Tea Party kind of activists saying the problem in this election is we had the wrong candidate. Romney wasn't really a true conservative and it, we just have to keep moving more to the right and then we'll find that true conservative and the country will rally around him or her. Um, We'll see what happens. Uh, I, I would love to see the Republicans move back um, in a more moderate direction. It's the absence of a middle in this country that I think is so worrisome. Um, uh, so it will happen. When it'll happen and by what means, I don't know. That's one scenario that's pretty hopeful in that regard. I, I wouldn't bet on it, but that's a possibility. Yeah. In the early stages of the 
that's a great question. I don't, I don't make quite as sharp a distinction as you do. I think the, the, you, you know, we talk about movements and parties as if these are separate things. They blur together at the margins. And so the Tea Party is not separate from the Republican Party. It's, it's also, it, there are organizations that stand apart from the Republican Party. But clearly, the Tea Party is now at some level integrated into the Republican Party. Um, and I don't think the parties are ever totally just reacting. I think they're powerfully trying to shape movements as well. I'll give you one quick example. When Kennedy was president, uh, you know, again, we, we now remember Kennedy, oh, he was an absolute staunch civil rights advocate. He wasn't, he wasn't, among his first acts, was appointing a host of super conservative judges to the federal bench uh, with very conservative racial uh, positions because, again, he was trying to accommodate the Dixiecrat wing of the party. The civil rights movement posed an enormous problem for him and then for Johnson as well. And in fact, I think this was quite consciously the strategic intention of the civil rights forces. They understood this Cold War dynamic. They understood that if they provoked segregationists to respond with violence, this would make front page news, not just in the United States, but around the world. And it would force a reluctant federal government to intervene. Kennedy didn't want to be put in that position, so he actually engineered a substantial amount of money to go from a foundation whose board he sat on engineered, a, offered essentially SNCC, the most activist of the civil rights organizations, money to engage in voter registration activity. His hope was, let's get them out of the street, let's get them, let's get them registering African American voters who will be Democrats, and then I won't have to intervene when we have these eruptions of violence in the South. I love what SNCC did. SNCC took the money and then engaged in a little bit of voter registration activity and stayed in the streets. <laughs> so it didn't work. But par parties are kind, always trying to manage and direct the energies of movements. Ronald Reagan, to me, was the master at this. He absolutely depended on grassroots, very right-wing support, Christian right, the, the pro-life movement but then held them at arm's length once, once he was in the White House. And a lot of them got very frustrated. So he was willing to appropriate the energies and support of those movements and then hold them at arm's length as best he could to govern more moderately, actually. Um, so parties are always an actor in this. Sometimes, though, the pressure of the movement is so strong that they they, they, they have to respond in some way. So I think you're, you're right that they were pretty reactive early on. This is an ongoing tug of war with party actors. You, you can bet tonight there are lots of worried Republican strategists, seriously, sitting going, what do we do with the energies of the Tea Party? Do we keep moving in that direction? Do we tack back to the middle? So this is an ongoing dynamic. It has been throughout American history with the exception of this 20-year period in the, in the post-war years. But great question. Yeah? In the most recent election, no, it, 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 um, that movement is certainly active and is having effects on, it had effects last Tuesday on ballot measures in a number of states, but I don't think it had significant effects on the, the presidential election. You follow what I'm saying? But Yes, this is another example of a movement that's certainly active and is seeking to impact politics and I think is having significant effects. But I don't see it playing out at the level of presidential politics, at least not in the last, in last week's election.
Uh, yeah, very good question. I, I can give you lots of specific examples. I don't think they were as prominent in those years, or this dynamic. What I'm trying to say about the polarization, though, is Nixon essentially successfully fashioned a new GOP that was substantially held together by this kind of politics of racial reaction. Watergate blurred all that. Um, Reagan re basically refashioned the same GOP, and maybe even a little bit more conservative. And so, you know, you're saying polarization continued. We were already very polarized by 1980 through these processes. Um, I would say that movements played a very significant role in Reagan's election in uh, 80. Um, there's a very complicated, interesting story about the Christian right, but it's too complicated, I think. Um, but there's, the Christian right played a significant role, and so did the pro-life movement. So those were new, relatively new movements that were pushing the GOP, I think, even further right. George Bush Sr., lots of people think he lost his re-election bid because his convention in Houston, uh, the pro-life wing of the party was so active and was so much in evidence at the convention that polls in the wake of the convention showed that lots of Americans were viewing the Republicans as now too extreme. And so it may have cost Bush, who himself is the most moderate of Republican president probably since Eisenhower, I would guess. He, he paid a price for that. So there again, you see the movement dynamic pushing the party, at least in appearance, further to the right than some Americans were comfortable. So I think that had an impact on the 88, or the 92 race. So those are some examples. Does that help? I, I think the Democrats have been largely spared these pressures because the left so badly splintered in the early to mid 70s that the, you can think of particular progressive movements, but no kind of nationwide, broad left coalition that would push the party to the left. So they've been relatively spared, I think, compared to Republicans. question was, you may not have heard, what about sort of the dramatic change in the media over the last 30, 40 years? Many, many, many more sources of information. Um, I think it's been hugely important, but I think I'm going to say exactly the opposite of what you said, but maybe I'm misunderstanding. You know, uh, when, certainly when I was growing up, 50s and 60s, there were net, you know, the, the only real source of information uh, besides <clears throat> newspapers, major dailies, and so forth, were the, the networks. And the networks were broadly centrist in their presentation of politics. Um, this surprised me. What do you think, uh, Walter Cronkite, again, some of you are too young, but m many of you are not. What do you think Walter Cronkite's political views were? Very, very, very liberal Democrat. I didn't know that. I certainly wouldn't have known it watching him deliver the news because the journalistic norms were you, you, know, you suppressed your own views. You tried to be as balanced and as objective as you could be. And I think Walter did a reasonable job of that. Now, there are so many sources of information that we're not all attending to centrist discourse coming from the national the networks or the major dailies. 
And if you happen to believe, if you're part of the 13% of the American public that believes that Obama is the Antichrist, and that's what the, that's what the latest survey shows, you can bet there are three blogs that you can log on to tomorrow to get new evidence of that. And this is a, this is a significant problem. I'm, not, I'm all for freedom of speech and expression, but the, the wide range of ideological views that are readily available mean that if you have a strong ideological disposition, you can feed it every day without having to confront alternative information. And that's also reinforcing a polarized America. Again, these are some of the complicated normative issues I was, I was talking about earlier. So it's a great, great question and, and full of all sorts of complexities. Nobody's for restricting information, but we have to be aware of what kinds of trends it reinforces. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to pre-raise a question that you just uh, You touched on away from it, uh, it's a question of good and bad. Uh, so, you know, maybe it comes from my being a, a, a philosopher, not a social a, a, a scientist. Uh, the era bipartisan consensus that you described uh, was one in which the bipartisan consensus maintained vicious racism, Jim Crow, uh, horrible homophobic uh, consensus. Uh, deep poverty, it was a time when typically being old was associated with uh, uh, being poor, and it saw the birth and flourishing of a horribly unjust war in mm -hmm. the China, hundreds of thousands, right. needlessly killed. Uh, it seems to me, though mm, one could debate this, that movements played a big role in ending those bad things, uh, Jim Crow, massive homophobia, mm -hmm. uh, alliance between the civil rights movement and poor people's movements and the left in, in general, somewhat reducing the burdens of poverty, so now that old age is not associated uh, with uh, uh, being poor, ending, helping to end the war in Vietnam. It seems to me that the moral of this story might be social movements are good, as Suzanne pointed out, not much polarization now on the part of Democrats if they're not massively winning election after election. Mm -hmm. Probably that's a story of the force of money and certain institutional biases that social movements might be a, a, a way of overcoming. Mm -hmm. So, see, why I'm not resisting anything you're saying, but so takeaway lesson that someone can have about the, the trend to be lamented. I think on the big issues, the trends are not to be lamented. It's bad to have inequality, but it's really bad to have lots of people poor. Mm -hmm. uh, is polarization standing in the way, or is whatever standing in the way best resisted by, best changed by social movements, even though in a sense they might increase polarization, Democratic Party might be for someone to the left. Yeah, very thoughtful and tough, tough question. I don't, and maybe because I'm a social scientist, not a political philosopher, I don't have a ready answer. I certainly uh, would not say that the broad storyline that is movements were good, see what they did. I'm simply calling attention to a feature really a recurring feature of American politics that's been substantially left out of our narrative accounts of the last 50 years and out of the specific accounts about, of how we got from where we, are, or, or where we were to where we are. People talk about political polarization and they talk about growing inequality and they talk about party dynamics. Parties are, have powerfully are, are powerfully in, uh, in tension with or interacting with movements. And that's been a central feature of American politics from the very beginning. We were born as a movement. We've been shaped throughout our history by this tug of war between movements, parties, and governing institutions. And it's remarkable to me that 
the, the, the central role of social movements in the last 50 years have been largely organized out of scholarly discourse on the period. Part of it owes, I think, to a disciplinary division of labor between political science and sociology. Sociology, uh, let me say it the other way, political science primarily studies political institutions. So they study parties and they study governing, government institutions and so forth. They sort of resign social movements or assign social movements to the error term of politics. They don't see movements as terribly, a terribly significant phenomena. So uh, political sociologists, on the other hand, have, have made the study of social movements a major subfield, and oftentimes they sort of, uh, uh, the, the literature on social movements suggests that movements are the center of the political universe, and states and governments spin around the movements. That's an absolute fiction. Um, but neither uh, discipline does a terribly good job of really seriously taking political institutions and parties and movements uh, seriously as co-equals in shaping uh, uh, politics. And that's all I'm trying to do here. So I'm going to defer the normative judgment to people who, are, who have training, much better training than me. And there's so many normative issues, complicated normative issues, I think, around the story I've told. But all I'm trying to do is to, again, bring social movements into the story as an important part. Right here, sir. There's a, right. there's, a, there's a series of things that uh, McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal argue, and they really are quite complicated. Let me just say one. Um, and it's not independent of uh, the Republican dominance in policymaking during this period. So their point is Republicans have largely been in control of economic policymaking in this period. If the parties are very polarized, it's very hard to actually generate bipartisan consensus on significant policy changes. So a polarized system is a status quo favoring system. You can't reach these grand bargains that dramatically change policy. So since the economic policy, tax policy, for instance, has been substantially set by Republican administrations, it's virtually impossible, given the polarized state of Congress, to reach a grand bargain to change it. So that's one of the arguments they make. There's a couple others, but that's the easiest to convey. I certainly haven't. I certainly haven't. This has been work that's been done much more by Larry Bartels and some others who've spoken in the series. It's not my, it's not my scholarly bailiwick. So I think there's good evidence that policymaking has impacted more the after tax, for sure. Um, and again, that's work that people have done. I, I haven't done that particular research. Um, but I, th I find it fairly convincing. That's not the only thing that's driving inequality. We know that. There have been global changes. Uh, so there are other kinds of factors that are, that are impacting these trends as well. But I'm convinced by the weight of evidence by people who have made it their specialty that government policy under Republican administrations in relationship to Democrat has had a measurable impact on increasing inequality mostly of the after-tax variety. You're right. OK. What does that have to do with tonight's talk? Okay. 
certainly not in a narrow empirical sense. I mean, I'm not doing any original research here, I'm, although I'm drawing a lot on the research I have done. My main complaint in that book is that social movement scholars do not take account of other significant actors like political institutions and parties. So this story I'm trying to tell is not a movement story. It's a story about the interaction or tug of war between powerful political actors embedded in parties, government, institutions, and social movement organizations. Um, so I feel very comfortable assuming that stance. Uh, on on the, the, the issue of causality, to tell the kind of story I'm trying to tell and to marshal the kind of evidence that I'm trying to marshal in this book, um, I'm going to use historical methods. Um, I don't have, uh, I don't want to be restricted to such a narrow definition of causality. I want to be able to tell the sweep of this story. I think I can tell it convincingly using historical methods that most readers will find convincing that movements are an important part of the shifts that I'm, I'm documenting in, in the book. Other issue, one last question. You better make it a good one. So I have a lot of pressure here. Um, I was just thinking, uh, is there any way that a third party candidate uh, could come into a general election and really change um, the party dynamics like it did with Wallace? Um, yeah, I, yes. I, yes, I, at, the, at this moment, one of the things I'm really curious about is whether if you, if you look at um, survey evidence about Americans are extraordinarily frustrated with this situation. Uh, and again, the levels of trust and lack of confidence show that. Um, there's also a long, uh, there's a, lo a, a long history, about 50, 60 years of time series data on sort of representative samples of Americans, and the question is asked, um, you know, do you identify as a liberal, a conservative, a moderate? I forget all the terms that are used. Um, there's been virtually no change in that distribution for 60 years. So it is not the American public writ large that's polarized. It's political elites that are polarized. The, Ameri the, mo the modal American is still a moderate centrist and feeling increasingly out of, uh, sort of ignored by the warring political elites. That's at least my reading of the situation, oversimplified reading perhaps. But I think the American public is less polarized and is generally turned off by the degree of polarization it sees in the country. If a strong third party centrist ran, make it up Bloomberg, or if Christie wanted to become a moderate centrist Republican or something. In other words, somebody with a degree of visibility and, and uh, a lot of legitimacy were to say, you know, the, we're in a mess. We're too deeply polarized. We can't really engage in uh, productive lawmaking or policymaking because of these divisions. I'm going to reoccupy the middle and I'm going to call on Americans to rally around. This person wouldn't win the general election. But he might, again, through that kind of third party movement, put pressure on both parties to be more responsive to the middle. So I, I think, it's, I think it's, it's quite possible. Will it happen? I don't know. But I think this, the moment is sort of ripe for something like that. Before we say it doesn't matter, I want to acknowledge another big hole in the series and tell you how we're going to fill it. We haven't had an economy. And we haven't had anybody talking uh, about 